good morning. Uh, it's a different time. InfoHealth is usually held, I guess, by tradition every second Wednesday and, uh, and in the afternoon at 2 p.m. So this is a change. The important, th the, the important thing is that the time remains the same through the series. So people kind of learn what to expect uh, without a calendar. So that now today's about low back pain and sciatica. This has got to be the bane of many physicians' lives and patients. It's incredibly common. It's uh, very expensive to healthcare systems. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later because uh, Walmart and other large companies in the United States changed how they uh, supported uh, their staff with uh, uh, chronic low back pain and sometimes with sciatica um, with a rather innovative program. So um, let's move along. And now what's, let's see. Oh, it is stuck. Why? Uh -huh. huh. So one thing, just a little perspective, the pros and cons of walking on four or two feet. What is the price of being a two-footed species? And this was amusingly brought to my attention by Jeremy De Silva, by a recent book, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. It's a great book. He's a good writer. Uh, he, uh, he's a good scientist. He's a paleoanthropologist. Uh, he gets his hands dirty uh, in the field. Uh, but one of the interesting paragraphs in the book was a comparison. Well, gee, was it all upside to go to a two-footed animal? Well, it isn't. And it's a particularly relevant today because as he points out with four-footed animals, uh, they develop very little of the kind of degenerative changes that humans do in their discs and in their vertebra and in the joints in the back and probably very few of the symptoms that we do. So that's part of the price of being bipedal. Now here's a, here's a rather detailed one. I don't know whether this popped up, what happened? Oh, no. Oh, take it off camera. Okay. All right. So um, this is a, a colleague of mine in Boston, Alan Roper, uh, wrote a paper on um, sciatica, uh, kind of a review back in 2015. This is, uh, I rather like this, this, uh, this uh, slide, but it's busy. So I just got to walk you through that a little bit with my pointer, because here's the normal lower back. And uh, as if you could see through the vertebral column to see the, the nerve roots behind, it's called the cauda equina or the, or the horse's tail, so to speak. And uh, once those nerve roots exit through various uh, uh, foramina on the way down, uh, they kind of reform and uh, join up with one another and form one large nerve, the sciatic nerve. Uh, which is one of the reasons why he added sciatica, or to, that was the prime title of the, of the paper. Now, in the middle here is an example of a disc at the L4, L5 level, and it's compressing the L5 root. Um, here's another one that illustrates another form of pathology, and that is, now I actually, I don't know whether this is going to work, but I brought George along. Uh, my skeleton. I don't know whether you can see this or not, but there are joints. And sometimes if you divide the screen, uh, uh, but anyway, there are these joints at the back of the spine. And that's where most of the degenerative changes take place that uh, kind of create symptoms in our age group, really beginning around the kind of late 40s and then the 50s and then and increasing. So that's what's illustrated in this, in, this, in this drawing here by this kind of thickening of this joint. But sometimes also a disc will protrude and sit right on top of the nerve root. But, um, but also that big fat sciatic nerve, which is as big as my thumb, goes through a muscle and through a hole in the back of our pelvis. That muscle is called the piriformis muscle. 
And uh, uh, I have to say that for, for a long, long time, it was thought that most back and sciatic leg pain was related to uh, uh, injury to this, to this large nerve. Well, it isn't, except that it sometimes does happen. And who does it happen to? It happens mostly to males uh, because they tuck a thick wallet uh, in their right back pocket, and then they sit on it. And guess what that wallet is sitting right over? The sciatic nerve. So uh, that's an uncommon but, but easily remedied thing if people kind of understand that, gee, uh, my foot going numb or my lower leg going numb while I'm driving, gee, if I just kind of change my position or took the wallet out of, out of that pocket, the symptoms would go away. Um, and then, um, oh, we've got this thing kind of sitting on top of me, for me. But at the bottom, at least on the right, uh, tumors in, in, the, in the pelvis can sometimes press on nerves and cause symptoms. That's actually got to be pretty uncommon. But what isn't uh, so uncommon are birth injuries. After all, the child has to get through a very constrained uh, uh, passageway. And, uh, and those nerves are sitting right there. So I don't go, go back to George here, but there's the pelvis. Here, here are all these nerves, the lumbosacral plexus here, and the head is going through here. So it's really a setup or compression of those nerves there. And uh, probably explains why some mothers for a period of hours or sometimes days after the delivery of their child, they have some numbness in their foot or leg. Now, let's just move on. Now, how common is uh, low back pain? Well, it's really common. I would think that probably most people, if you reach the generous age of 70 plus, have had at least one or more acute episodes of, uh, of lower back and leg pain. And fortunately, uh, probably 95% of the time, uh, they recover within a matter of a few days or maybe at the most two or three weeks. Now, something about the clinical patterns in low back pain. Now, just before I deal with this kind of slide, we're really talking about two groups here. We're talking about those who are young, meaning what's young, uh, kind of mid teenage years through to maybe 40s, low 50s, and then another group uh, beginning in those early 50s and running right through to 80s and 90s. Both experience troubles with their back, but those uh, in the older age group are much more complex. So in the younger group, it's very common to have a single bout of low back pain, maybe lifting something really heavy, Lifting and twisting, shoveling snow is a, is a favorite here. And, uh, and sometimes there are one or more relapses of that. But what becomes increasingly common in people in their 50s and 60s is pain or some aching soreness in the back, plus or minus the, the, the one or both legs. That's kind of there most of the time. It fluctuates in intensity aggravated by some physical activity. Um, and, but it's a, it tends to be a chronic problem. And then, especially in the 70s uh, and 80s, sometimes, and, and I, I can remember one person stands out that was a member of a choir in, in Boston, and she had been a loyal fan and, and participant in the choir, but found that um, if she had to stand for too long, that she did develop this pain in her lower back, her buttocks that extended into her thighs. That's the pattern of so-called neurogenic claudication. That's the sign of, of a spinal canal that's much narrower than it should be, probably over several segments. And then rarely, sometimes if, the, if there's a large protrusion, Usually it's a disc, but a very large one that protrudes right in the midline 
it catches the nerve roots that supply the bladder. And so people have trouble peeing, and, uh, but they also um, develop numbness in the soles of the feet and the backs of the legs. That's actually an emergency, but fortunately that's very uncommon. Now, risk factors. I was thinking about this because we have the French Open on now on tennis and Roger Federer is back. Uh, he's back after an operation on his back. Um, injuries to the back and single nerve root syndromes are really common in athletes. And uh, you know about the uh, difficult, difficulties that Tiger Woods has had over the years. He has multiple surgical procedures on his back. And I have to say, the more procedures you have, the more difficult and problematic the outcome. Uh, there are a lot of troubles with, uh, with lower back and sometimes the legs that are related to work. And that's why Walmart got involved. And I'll just take a few seconds out to describe that because uh, the Walmart, Walmart is a big company. And a large part of their, their uh, healthcare medical budget was spent on people with, on sick leave and getting um, uh, care, medical care for lower back uh, uh, symptoms and sometimes sciatica. And, and there seemed to be a great deal of variability in the cost and the quality of the outcome. So what they did together with several other uh, large companies, as I said, well, let's standardize this. And they chose three major centers in the United States. The Mayo Clinic was at the top of the list. And they pay the airfare, the hotel, all the bills associated with uh, the Mayo Clinic assessment and if necessary, the surgery. And what this brought was really high quality care to their employees and in the aggregate, a lot less expense. And in the article I wrote in the uh, Blake report, I alluded to this um, as a good way to go in the Canadian healthcare system. We do have centers of excellence uh, in certain areas in, in medicine, but, um, but not so much with lower back problems. And we're often uh, you know, looking around to find out who's a good surgeon, who isn't, that kind of thing. Uh, it would really help to, to have one or more uh, centers of excellence, uh, at least with respect to lower back problem. Well, obviously weight is a, is a predisposing if you overweight and less active, that certainly uh, contributes to the compressive forces on the back. Lifting and twisting I've already alluded to. Uh, people who have been on corticosteroids, uh, that uh, causes uh, leaching of calcium out of uh, the bones and, um, and weakness and sometimes vertebral collapse. But there are other reasons for that. I remember when I was in Boston, uh, I was at the Tufts Medical Center, and the Tufts Medical Center was right in the middle of Chinatown. And one day, um, uh, an old man, uh, I think maybe seemed to be about five feet tall, but uh, a shrunk, uh, quite a short man, and lean and quite friendly. And he came with his, uh, with his granddaughter. And it turned out that he had been on the Great March, a Mao's Great March or retreat for the Japanese, and also to get away from uh, the nationalists. And on that march, I mean, it was a foot march and over uh, uh, mountains, and very, very difficult, uh, several hundred miles. And he remembered carrying these heavy loads. And sometimes at the end of the day or for several days, and this march took place over several months, he had acute back pain. And it was all he could do to kind of, kind of get on with the job the next day. But they all did. Now, why am I telling you the story? Because he had the most unusual spine I've seen. He had multiple, he had evidence of multiple old healed vertebral fracture. And I would guess that those periods of severe pain lasting uh, several days or a week or so were probably periods of when one of those vertebra collapsed under the load. And no doubt malnutrition played its part too. 
interestingly enough, uh, it was the most formative period in his, in his life. And uh, so, despite all of that pain, it was transformative for him. Now, um, this drawing is from the article uh, by uh, Alan Roper in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's actually not a bad picture of Alan, a side view that the artist kind of caught, wearing his, uh, his official white coat. But uh, it, it illustrates one way of uh, confirming whether or not a nerve root is compressed. And that is by just extending the leg or lifting the leg up and sometimes uh, forcing the foot up as well. It puts the nerve root on a stretch as it goes through a constrained uh, foramen or past the disc and, uh, and, and patients will wince at that time. And, uh, and then it's a good time to be, well, what exactly did you experience? Well, I had tingling or sharp pain and it extended in down my leg, but uh, it extended into the top of my foot and the big toe. Well, if that's the story, it's an L5 root problem. If he tells you that, gee, it, uh, it went down the back of my calf and the outside of my foot, uh, that tells you it's the next root, the first sacral root. So the history is actually very important, but sometimes this kind of provocative test is helpful for sorting out which disc is, is involved. Now, this is just to illustrate some of those things. I don't know whether I was able to show you some of them, at least in George. But here's a normal vertebra. Uh, there's, the, there's the disc, and it's, it kind of has a soft jelly-like core. Um, and there's normally lots of space in the back for all of this, the cauda quina, all of those nerve roots to get through. And those joints at the back look, look normal. Now we go down here, and we can see some of those changes because there's a thick ligament at the back here just underneath that spinous process, which is a lot thicker here. And that really begins to crowd the space. And not only that, but the disc is protruding into that space and making things worse still. You can see the thickening of the joint here, of that posterior joint. That's a joint between successive vertebrae in the back. So the thickening of that ligament at the back of the canal, the thickening of the bony joint to the side and the protrusion of the disc. Um, then you can see this on the lateral view. Here's a relatively normal looking disc, but with age uh, and especially these lower discs, the between L4 and L5, the five and S1, the discs begin to flatten and bulge. So creating this picture down here. And those posterior joints, that's a lateral picture of the, of the degenerative ch changes in those posterior joints. And um, so that's kind of what's going on. But there's another thing that happened and incident incidentally happened with my Chinese patient here is that sometimes um, one vertebra will slip forward on another. And uh, we'll get to this a little bit later. But um, and that, that further crowds that available space for these nerve roots to go through. So let's just move along. Now, what about the quality of the pain and the other symptoms? Well, patients vary in how they describe it, but certainly uh, some people, if they just move in a certain way, they'll feel a, a very sharp, stabbing, electric shock-like sensation. Sometimes there's a burning sometimes aching, triggered by bending or coughing or sneezing. And commonly associated with that is a tingling or numb sensation in the territory of that root. And I already alluded to that earlier. And that's actually very helpful clinically. If that tingling involves the top of the foot and especially the big toe, it's L5. If it involves the outside of the foot, the lateral side of the foot, uh, and perhaps the sole, that's the first sacral root. If it involves the kind of the inside, just below the knee, the, the medial side of the knee and a little bit below, that's L4. That has a high specificity. 
the, the, that, that, that's actually very useful information. And sometimes people will have weakness and loss of muscle bulk in muscle supplied by the root. And that too is highly predictive. So for example, if somebody has weakness of cocking up the big toe or the ankle or turning the ankle out to the side, that's L5. If they have weakness in turning the toes down and the foot down, that's S1. Those are highly specific. And if they lose their ankle jerk, that the doctor takes a little tendon reflex hammer and taps you on the, on the, on the Achilles tendon, and that reflex is lost, that's S1. And if they tap you at the knee and your knee jerk is reduced, that's L4, probably. So uh, those are, it, it's, a, it's an example of where clinical information that comes from the history and something as simple as the as a clinical examination actually provides uh, better information than the imaging studies because it's telling you which nerve roots are symptomatic. That's the point here. So just in summary, for the at the L4-5 level, the L5 root, that pain and tingling in the lateral buttock, the outside of the of the butt, and the posterior lateral thigh, but it, but especially important, the top of the foot and the big toe. And for the S1 root, I mentioned here the outside of the foot and, um, and sometimes the sole of the foot. So that clinical information is really very important. Now, sometimes even the best people make mistakes. Uh, so here's the New England Journal of Medicine from an article here, and they're talking about the sensory impairment here, somebody with an L5 root and they left out the big toe at the top of the foot. Gee, that's the most commonly affected, not so much the lateral side of the calf, although that too. So that was an odd miss by a very good, um, by a very good article and writer. So um, now, um, the clinical information about which nerve root is involved is, is symptomatic tells you which root is involved. It doesn't tell you which disc is involved. It doesn't tell you what level is involved. Because sometimes, depending on where the disc protrusion is or the encroachment on the, on the spinal canal is, it might involve a, a higher root or a lower root. So here's, um, here's kind of a, the usual situation. It's very diagrammatic here, but... Uh, uh, but here's the L4 vertebra, the L5 one, then the sacrum would be down here. And here's a, you know, a cartoon-like large disc here. And it's pushing on this L5 root, okay? It's not pressing on the L4 root, which escapes higher up. And it's not pressing on the S1 root because it's more medial. So the symptomatic nerve root is at the usual level it's at the L4-5 level and it affects the L5 root. Now here's that, this is the cauda quina thing. Here I've mentioned this, all of these nerve roots kind of going down the, down the middle of the spinal canal here. And if there were a large disc here at L4-5 or for that matter, L5 and S1 here, but a large disc here and it went directly backwards, it can affect not only the lower lumbar roots, say L4-5, but the sacral roots, which supply the bladder and the feeling in, the, in, the, in, in our bottom here. So that's the one that really, if, if this actually happened in real life, that would be an emergency. So just to talk a little bit more about the natural history of acute low back pain, in the young, uh, a third or much better within a week. Uh, but there's a high recurrence rate. And I think that's probably true of most people I've seen. Uh, if they might've had a, a, a bout, some people describe it as my back going out, in quotes. And, um, and they may have seen a chiropractor, may have done nothing about it, whatever, it may get better. But there might be another bout a year later two years later, three years later, uh, whatever. So recurrences are common, but 
uh, but the symptoms usually resolve. But then in older patients here, I should have got, got an interrupted line along here because these are, this really applies to younger people. But now in older people like me, or those a decade or two younger, in older people, the prognosis for improvement and even complete resolution of the back pain is still good. Now that's a quote. I would disagree with that. I don't think it is good, meaning I think that most people, once the pain's there, it becomes chronic. It may vary in intensity, that's for sure. But, uh, but after all, you haven't changed the anatomy or the pathology of the back. So, and that's what I mean here in this next slide. Chronic low back pain tends to remain the same and may even gradually slowly progress. Now, this is an old slide from an old paper, but the reason I put it up here is I, a, a common default when, when somebody saw me about this kind of problem, or especially when people see a surgeon, is there, they've often had a, an, an MRI done or a CT scan or both of them done. And, um, and they say, gee, they found a disc protrusion, <clears throat> a ruptured disc at this level or that. Well, um, that's got the ducks in the wrong order. The, the most important thing you have to decide is what level is causing the symptoms. And then you look at the imaging studies to decide whether whatever you're looking at is relevant. Now, the point I'm making here, or he's making here in this paper, Weinstein, is that these are volunteers under the age of 60 now. Half of them had a bulging disc and a little more, a larger disc, herniated disc, and a fifth of them. Those are people without any symptoms. And, um, and, and it's true, and in, in there are two other studies here that showed the same thing. So you really have to, I had to be really careful about, um, uh, about assessing the relevance of, of, of x-rays and, um, and CT and MRI studies, always looking for that match between symptoms uh, and findings, clinical findings. And then going to the imaging studies and saying, okay, what, what targets should I look at here? What are, what, what, what's going to be relevant here? Now, here's, here's one, just to walk you through this. This is somebody uh, with a disc protrusion at the L4-5 level. And, uh, and this is an MRI study. By the way, if it's white here, it's spinal fluid, it's water. There's the end of the spinal cord. You can just see it. So that's uh, L1, L2, L3, L4, 5. Anyway, oh, what is that level? That's where the cord usually ends, at, uh, between L1 and 2. Anyway, so there's the spinal fluid. You can see the nerve roots kind of hanging down loosely. Normally, they got a lot of space. And then you go down a little further between L3 and 4, and you see a little protrusion. But it kind of pushes back gently on those free hanging nerve roots. There are probably no symptoms. But then look at this large disc here between L4 and 5, and clearly displacing the roots. Now, you take another view of this, uh, kind of a horizontal slice. And here it is on the right-hand side, left-hand side for the picture, but right-hand side for the patient. Here's the vertebra, the disc right here. Here's that spinal canal here. There's the spinal fluid, that kind of white stuff in here. Here are those darkish things or kind of nerve roots here. Here are these joints at the back. There's the spinous process. So if you feel along your back and you feel, along, feel those little bumps, well, that spine is what you're feeling right back here. So look at the space here. Here's a disc protrusion, posterior lateral disc protrusion right here. And that would probably have been okay, except that the adjacent 
posterior joint here is all enlarged because of degenerative changes in that joint. So we already have a fixed narrow canal through which this nerve root is going through. And by the way, there's the nerve root right there, that light gray thing here. So that nerve root is clearly pitched. Now, look at the asymptomatic side. You could drive a truck through here. There's no disc protrusion. There is degenerative change in that posterior joint, but it's certainly not crowding significantly that exit canal here. And that's uh, the ganglion, the, the enlargement where the nerve cells uh, for the nerve roots are. So that's what you're seeing in here. But there's lots, lots of space there. So the symptoms here would probably be if um, would be that tingling and pain in the in the back, the outside of the lateral buttock, uh, down the lateral side of the calf, top of the foot, and into the big toe, just as I mentioned earlier. Now, sometimes there, you know, what are the reasons? For especially in, in older people, uh, I'm probably the central figure sitting in the middle of the age spread. But, uh, but let's face it, as we get older, other things happen. So one of the reasons for getting CT scans and MRI studies, particularly MRI studies at the back, is that um, unfortunately other things happen, like infections in joint spaces, uh, cancer, uh, secondary spread to, to some of these vertebral bodies. And that's kind of what we're looking at right here. Uh, so other, other bad things happen. That, that's reason enough in the face of persistent lower back pain, or especially if it's getting worse, uh, to get imaging studies done. Now, these degenerative changes in the spine um, they also happen in the neck, and that's what we're going to cover next month. But they occasionally happen in the back, in the thoracic spine. And here's a thoracic disc. It doesn't look like there's a spinal cord, by the way. We're not dealing with nerve roots here. There's a spinal cord coming down, lots of room, until it gets here, between T6, between thoracic 6 and 7. And then you see this disc kind of sticking back. Uh, and, and so this is somebody who probably had weakness in both legs and maybe a loss of feeling right up to the belly button uh, in front, uh, maybe a little lower than that. But anyway, so good reasons for getting those imaging studies done. But what about the management of low back pain and the options? Well, um, first thing I'm going to say is that there there haven't been a lot of good studies. Given how common low back pain and sciatica are, it's surprising how few good controlled studies there are. Um, many of the best studies come from Europe. And what I'll highlight, the recent one from Canada, from London, just down the highway. Um, so whenever you see a list of options like this, you know that none of them are really all that helpful and probably uh, debatable about their diagnostic or therapeutic value. So um, that involves uh, muscle relaxants and other medications, physiotherapy, massage. Now I did do two years ago, I think, I had a chiropractor, a local chiropractor from Virgil here, and that was actually quite helpful. And I was the guinea pig and made up the story and then um, he manipulated my back. It was actually worthwhile, I think, for, for uh, some of the public to actually see what they do when they manipulate the back. And um, uh, it was certainly a revelation to me. Um, I was very skeptical of that kind of thing for years and years. Um, and I'll just take tell you a little anecdotal story, but I have a very good friend who's uh, uh, an engineer out in uh, British Columbia. And, um, and Peter was a very straightforward guy. Um, and, but uh, 
Jan and I were visiting and he had a lot of back pain, but he wasn't talking about it, just looked uncomfortable. So we talked about it and, and, um, and then the next morning, um, I said, I have to go somewhere. <laughs> it came out, he was going to his chiropractor. And I said, gee, uh, Peter, would you mind if I came along? I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut, but I just wanna find out what goes on. And he said, oh, it's okay, but keep your mouth shut. And, um, and which I did. Well, it, it was very interesting because, uh, because uh, when I watched this particular chiropractor describe the findings that he was seeing on the x-rays, I frankly couldn't see them. I, I, I didn't know what he was actually talking about. And I do know my way around x-rays of the back. And I'm not sure that I understood what he actually did with the therapy, but I can tell you that from somebody who had spent the last uh, week and a half really visibly uncomfortable and, um, and uh, not all that willing to talk about it, but certainly limiting. Peter was a lot better leaving. So I thought, well, gee, I really don't understand what's going on. I don't pretend to understand, but, uh, but somebody I know and I know well was, was much better. By the way, that led to the um, Info Health session on chiropractic therapy. So it's always good to keep one's mind open. But I can tell you, probably most of the profession, my profession, has a skeptical view of, of uh, many of these procedures, except the ones that they carry out, like the facet joint injection or electrical stimulation, for which a controlled study actually showed no value to controlled studies. Corticosteroid injections, if actually carry substantial risk. Um, and uh, so anyway, those are things that we could talk about later. Now here's the, the London study. Uh, so this was uh, uh, last year. Now London has, has one of the best orthopedic departments in the country and has had that for at least 30 years. And it was interesting to me to see the authors on this paper because I think at least two of them were sons of fathers that I knew well as practicing orthopedic surgeons. And, but this is a single center trial, which has its pluses and minuses, uh, pluses in that it's uniform, everyone playing by the same rule book. And, uh, and what they showed was that, was that uh, of people who um, had persistent leg pain, sciatica, lasting for several months, that surgery, in this case, microsurgery, so-called post-extent surgery, was superior to kind of, kind of um, non-surgical management. I might say that the non-surgical management uh, was done by a first-class uh, department of physical medicine and rehab. So that's one of the things I like about the study. It was really well done. And I, and I knew some of the principles involved. By the way, this is the technique of micro discectomy. I don't know well how much you could see this, but uh, I know that there are sometimes TV ads showing some very attractive young lady at a beach, I imagine somewhere, um, uh, showing her little uh, 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 band-aid over the small wound that she had at her back and confirming that yes, her symptoms were all better. Well, it may not be that small, but it is certainly a small incision right over the target and said, so success depends on being certain that that is in fact the symptomatic level. And number two, that the, whatever the pathology is at that level is actually accessible by the surgical procedure. Because if the disc is out too far, too far out to the side, it's not within the surgical field. <clears throat> now in this kind of cartoon, like here, there, there are the, the cauda quieta, all the nerve roots lined up. There's the disc protrusion here. So there's the surgeon gaining access to it and plucking out that disc protrusion. Now, <clears throat> I'll add a, a little caveat here. 
When somebody takes out a disc like this, they're taking out the part of it that happens to be sitting on the nerve root. They're not taking out all of the disc that could come out. It's quite possible after an operation like this, indeed, larger operation, for more disc material to come out a second or a third time. And I've certainly had that experience. Uh, I can remember one um, uh, lady in her late 30s, and uh, she had one of the largest disc protrusions I've ever seen. And um, because I scrubbed in at the operation and you could see it on the, on the MRI study. And, and lo and behold, a year and a half later, she had a recurrent disc protrusion at exactly the same level because there, was, because there was still lots of disc there to kind of come out. And, um, and she was better after, after both of them. And uh, as far as I know, hasn't had a recurrence after the, after the second time. Now, um, there's a lot of debate about what to do about chronic uh, back pain or lumbar stenosis in our age group. So here's, here's a typical vignette. A 72-year-old woman with a four-month history, could be two or three years, of lower back pain that extended into, into the buttocks of the lateral thighs. Here's a really typical part. Previously, she had walked two miles a day. That would be our pandemic walk. Now she has difficulty walking two blocks and standing up for much more than 50 minutes at a time. That's classical lumbar stenosis uh, back pain. An examination revealed a slightly stooped posture. Why stoop? Because they get relief in the pain by a little flexion of the trunk. And um, so there have there, there are two questions here. Is there a place for surgery? And if there is, who? And, uh, and what would those criteria be? And then among surgeons, there are differences. Um, neurosurgeons are, are kind of minimalist. They, they take out as little as they can get away with. Um, but orthopedic surgeons often feel that, gee, uh, when you do what is fairly major surgery uh, on the back, and what they're doing, by the way, is there is over three or four levels, maybe at least two levels, and maybe three, even four, taking off these posterior joints unroofing the back of the spinal canal. So that, that translates as pretty major surgery. So orthopedic surgeons have argued, say, well, gee, that must, that must destabilize the back uh, because, it, because the roof is gone. And, uh, and well, we should fuse it and uh, put in some bony elements in there just to provide some strength and but, uh, but neurosurgeons have never been too keen about that. So all I can say right here, that whatever the argument for instability of the back goes, uh, and now three large, well done, um, multi-center trials, um, there doesn't seem to be any need for um, uh, 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 the uh, orthopedic surgeons carry out to kind of stabilize the back. That's, that's one thing. Then the next issue, what about surgery versus just not for uh, non-surgical management? Well, there does seem to be a case for in selected cases, and you might ask what is selected, but in selected cases for surgery, um, but, uh, and, and, and looked at within the first few months or even the first year, those who are operated seem to do better. But then if you look out at two years, and beyond that, they seem to be equal. So what was 
the advantage here. And um, so that's really the question. Um, I, I suppose one of the major problems is uh, problems of surgery in this area as well. What do you do? Because the pathology extends over several levels. It's almost impossible clinically to tell which levels, level or levels, are the symptomatic ones. In other words, the targets that you should go after. That's the issue. Um, so the place of surgery? Well, I think the consensus view would be for a small minority of patients. Um, uh, where the symptoms are persistent and severe enough to interfere with the patient's activities of daily living. And I added this one. There must be a very good fit between the symptoms, the physical findings, and whatever surgical target was relieved, was revealed by the imaging studies. Uh, without that fit, see if there isn't a good fit, um, I surgery usually doesn't work, at least in my experience. So, um, so here are, the, here are those studies on fusion versus laminectomy, and both of them, uh, uh, well, it's right there in the title of the paper. Fusion for lumbar stenosis, safeguard or superfluous surgical implant. It would seem to be superfluous surgical implant as of now. Um, and I mentioned these epidural glucocorticoid in, uh, uh, these are actually a combination of a local anesthetic and a cortisone-like drug, and injecting it into, into these, in the region of these posterior joints. I don't know whether you can see that, but in the region of the posterior joints, or sometimes around the, the disc or whatever they think is compressing the, the nerve roots. Um, that's, that's pretty problematic. Now, what about prevention? Well, staying fit uh, is certainly important. The core muscles are especially important. What's core? All of those muscles in the trunk. And, um, and we can talk more about that later, but, but this is really important. And um, because as much as the bony skeleton uh, provides uh, much of the support for the back, those muscles that surround the skeletal elements are probably just as important. And if they atrophy or if they're weak, um, that might well contribute to the symptoms. It's easier, to be careful lifting and twisting. In my experience, um, lifting and twisting is something I didn't think about, about shoveling snow or something like that. And, uh, and I just do it at then it happens. So I'm not sure that kind of advice uh, helps me. Um, well, I will just finish on one thing because there might well be some questions here, but isn't this gorgeous one? This is 2017. So this is a total eclipse of the sun. And what it reminded me of was really two things. One is uh, Einstein's um, uh, general relativity, whereby mass can bend light. So light from say from stars behind the, the sun can be picked up on earth if they have, because they curve around the edge of the sun. But what you're looking at here are, is the corona. That, uh, all that ionized, uh, very high temperature, uh, emission that comes from the sun and, and the interesting article just recently on on what, what on, on what's I mean we're, we're used to a daily weather report but there's actually a weather report with respect to the sun the sun goes through cycles of, uh, of a great burst of this uh, uh, discharge uh, and going well out into space and some, some of them disrupting communications on Earth, and, um, and, um, and other times of relative quiescence. So 
going on for years. So anyway, I like that one. Um, and just I think about this because I have a daughter up in uh, up in uh, Alaska, uh, on Kodiak Island. But this is uh, uh, this is uh, a Norwegian base, 200 miles south of the North Pole, and um, and that they monitor satellites, hundreds of satellites, Earth satellites. Hey, guess what she's doing there? I mean, she's all bundled up, but we know it's cold. Well, but she's got a rifle, and she's there looking for polar bears and um, trying to keep them away from the equipment that they've got there. So anyway, enough of that. So any, I don't know if there are any questions. This is the controversial area, I'll tell you, back pain. Okay, um, any thoughts or no? I see, everyone has no back trouble. Uh, can I ask okay. a question? Uh, I have a question about oh. the best way of strengthening yeah. the core of muscles. How would you suggest doing that? Um, well, one of them that 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 I've adopted, it, it, you know, I, um, uh, I'm talking about the, the flexion muscles that you know. So, so sit ups, those kind of muscles at, at the front. But, but it's the back muscles that at, at the back that we tend to that, that we tend to ignore, and those muscles can be tightened up. You know, like squeezing your butt as if you, you needed to go to the bathroom and you're holding it. You squeeze your butt at, at the back and also contract those muscles in front at the same time, which is what I'm doing right now. And uh, it's the kind of thing. I kind of incorporate in my kind of daily routine. After all, if I'm at the sink doing something or preparing soup or salad or whatever I'm doing, it doesn't take uh, more than a few minutes to do exactly both of those things or to incorporate some other exercise, but make sure that, that those, uh, that the, that those uh, paraspinal muscles and the obliques and, and the, and the, and the and the rectus femoris muscles in front, or rectus abdominis mu muscles in front, are contracting. So I, what I'm doing right, you can probably try it out yourself. But I can tighten my ventral abdominal muscles right now, but at the same time, I can squeeze my buttocks together, right, and uh, and stiffen my back. So you're actually strengthening those core muscles. Now the a kind of nice thing about that is you can do that on an airplane. Mm. You can do that in the post office, uh, just mm. waiting in line, and no one will know mm. that you're actually doing that. <laughs> but cumulatively, it adds up, uh, and 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 it, and it and it really, you know, one of the things I didn't show. Maybe I'll just go back here. One of the things I didn't show here was here. Go back here. <laughs> I, 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 I think I've pointed this out sometime before, but if you, these are the paraspinal muscles. We're talking about core muscles here. Here they are. This, this, these, there's the spinal canal, okay? This is the iliopsoas muscles, the kind of hip flexor muscles right here. The ventral abdominal muscles are up here. These are the paraspinal muscles at the back. Now you notice one thing? If this person was in their teens or 20s, this would all be dark, just like this. But what happens when we get older is the fat deposition and these muscles become more barbled um, and, and muscle atrophy takes place. These muscles are the one that are kind of, they form a network um, a segmental network that buttress the spine. 
So these are very important muscles to train. And if these were properly trained or, it, or, or properly conditioned, we wouldn't be seeing all that marbling in these paraspinal muscles. And by the way, I hate to remind you of all of this, but all of this up here is fat. That's what we're looking at. And this is, this is the bad fat. This is the good fat, by the way, at the back, the kind that everyone sees or that we might be aware of. Yeah, there's the skin here. So it's just subcutaneous fat, right? Um, notice the difference in color between that harmless, metabolically inactive fat and the color of the fat in the intra-abdominal cavity. That's metabolically active fat. It a actually generates hormones that affect glucose metabolism and, um, and not to our advantage. So, and that's the kind of stuff that kind of creeps up on us uh, as we get older. So the, these, now this is a view right down the middle of the back. So you're not seeing the muscle on a, on a side here, but you do here. So those, those, uh, um, those muscles that are specific, specifically um, form part of the muscular cage for the, for the bony skeleton, those are the most important one to train. And uh, by tucking in your tummy, you don't like when you're doing up your belt, that kind of thing, you tuck your tummy back in, you're contracting those ventral abdominal muscles. And if you turn and do the same thing, you, you are activating different ventral abdominal muscles when you do that. Um, uh, and then these back muscles, actually fairly easy to do if you say lie on your back and push your lower back into the floor you're strengthening these muscles. That's part of my routine in the morning, is training these muscles, as well as the, those ventral abdominal muscles, as well as these big muscles, this iliosolus muscle on both sides. So I think it's a good thing, kind of an investment mm -hmm. in, uh, in protecting my back. Now, I'm sure that my back doesn't uh, look like it did at 40 or 50. Um, but, uh, but symptomatically anyway, um, I'm okay. And, and I think there are things that you could do to prevent uh, trouble or at least head it off or, or, or reduce some of the symptoms. Now, there's not much that you're gonna do about this kind of thing. This degenerative change in the posterior joint here, um, that kind of wear and tear change um, that might produce a symptomatic root L5 or S1 root might not change that, but, uh, but you certainly uh, could help out with the symptoms that are related to, to, uh, uh, to lumbar stenosis over several levels. I think, I think you can certainly influence those things. Any other questions? Yeah, the trouble with this is that I can't show you actually these exercise kind of hard to do. Um, anything else? No, thank you. Yeah. Um, I can't hear you. Why can't I hear you? Norbert, do you have a question? You'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, unmute myself. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not muted. I have a question. Yeah. Is walking a good exercise to prevent back pain? Uh, come again on that. Is walking a good oh. exercise for preventing back pain? Yeah. You know, um, after reading <laughs> after reading this this book, I, I wondered about that. I thought about that. Because the forces are on, I mean, what, what are the, if, if you think about a four footed animal, they're like a suspension bridge, right? Uh, they have four, four legs 
They could even get around with three, kind of hobble about, just try to get around on one leg. Uh, not, not, not easily for us, but um, but they kind of we've kind of tipped it to the spine. So all of the forces are now vertical forces, right through the vertebra and the discs. And one of the common uh, uh, pathological changes in in the hominins erected bipedal hominins is that is that they uh, is that those disc spaces get narrower or narrower the disc rides out uh, what's left tends to kind of bulge out and narrow the canal and um, walking kind of doubles those forces like with each stride that the foot lands it kind of doubles so so it it can be jarring running can increase those forces up to seven and eight times. So I uh, is walking a good exercise? Yes, it is a very good exercise, for, for sure it is. And, uh, and especially, uh, I think the current guidelines are now are um, somewhere between four and five times a week for, for at least 30 minutes. And, and actually, at as good a pace as you can keep up, so you're not dawdling along. But we're talking about, when we're talking about that, we're talking about, I think, cardiovascular fitness. We're probably not talking about the fitness of our spine and our back, which is another uh, maybe argument for not walking on pavement, but walking on grass. It's kind of softer, cushions, cushions things, I would think. And it also adds a little proprioceptive variety because the ground is a little uneven. And, uh, and so you're constantly making these little minor adjustments. And we did a talk on falls, at the risk of falls. Some of that is proprioceptive problem, meaning that, uh, that we don't get the same cues that we used to about when we're slightly off balance and how to recover from that. So I, I think it's a good thing when I get out for walks try to stay on grass if, if it's reasonably even. Uh, and fortunately, uh, Niagara on the Lake hasn't paved every single street on both sides. Uh, so you could actually do that. Or just get out in the countryside. Uh, boy, we've got countryside here within a kilometer, or a kilometer and a half. So there's lo lots of kind of nice places to walk. But maybe not the most fine friendly thing is to be walking on concrete or stuff with no give, particularly for somebody who has lumbar stenosis, that is significant symptomatic lumbar stenosis. Um, and it, as I mentioned, remember I mentioned that walking was one of the aggravating postures for people with lumbar stenosis. They actually get relief, they get out walking and, uh, and the distance they can walk is limited by their back pain or, or thigh and, and buttock pain, but it's also limited by the back pain and they kind of want to sit down or you'll see them leaning forward a bit to get relief. They're trying to get pressure off the back. So, um, so I think if you, or just speaking from the perspective of lumbar stenosis alone, uh, I'm not sure walking helps, but from the cardiovascular, from the larger picture of cardiovascular stroke uh, picture, I think walking is very important. And I, I also think that many of us have some of our best thoughts and uh, we're most creative when we're walking. In fact, I saw a whole list of, of uh, famous scientists and uh, people in the arts who uh, claim that their most creative moment were out walking. So uh, walking is a good thing. Anything else? I wish we could demonstrate that. At the end of, uh, I will be very happy when, uh, when, uh, when, I mean, I'm very grateful for this medium, but there are certain things we simply cannot show. Uh, uh, this way, so. Uh, Dr. Brown? 
Yeah. I have a question here in the chat um, about do you can you recommend any supplements for those of us with osteopenia and osteoporosis? Yeah, osteoporosis. Well, osteoporosis is on the way to uh, osteopenia is on the way to osteoporosis. Really, a matter of degree, isn't it? So, um, I think most. Um, I think the general guidelines are at least a thousand international units of, of vitamin D, and uh, maybe four hundred milligrams of uh, of uh, calcium uh, in some salt form that uh, seems to be the recommended uh, and that seems seems to work now vitamin D of course we've had beautiful weather so it's hard to believe that uh, that you would need a thousand or two thousand now some people I know take two thousand uh, or more international units uh, because of the claim that uh, that vitamin E has some protective effect against uh, infections like COVID, and uh, maybe it does, but I think that's a guess. I I don't know. Um, but but I think that that and and I, I might also say that a, a good uh, general vitamin is good. You know the ones that are formatted for. for um, for people 50 and over, I, I think, I think that, that's, that that's very important. It's surprising how many people actually don't take vitamin supplements. And that is an issue because, uh, because of, the, of the kind of diets that, that we eat, that uh, unless you're really careful, it's, it's actually fairly easy to become deficient um, in some, some of the vitamins. And so, um, but anyway, a thousand international units of, of vitamin D, fine. So um, I've actually stopped right now. And why? Because I have kidney stones. And actually, uh, vitamin D can actually increase the risk of those stones. So why would I do that when I've got a glorious sun, uh, sunlight out there? Um, anything else? Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, if you have questions, you know, you can always email them to me and I will pass them on to Dr. Yeah. Brown and he'll be able to. So if you can't think of anything right now, that's fine. I know we're getting a bit long. So um, feel free to send me an email and I will be happy to forward that. And uh, Dr. Brown is always gracious enough to give a very well-informed answer. Um, so unless there's anybody else that has something that they want to ask right now. Yeah, I was just going to ask the group that's here just about the next one, because the next one uh, is a natural follow on to that. This is the same degenerative process in the neck. But then I thought, gee, maybe it's uh, maybe it's time to uh, do uh, an update on COVID. Where, where, where we are, I was going to do that anyway in August. But if anyone has, um, I'm happy by the way. Uh, but but we are in kind of a transition time, I think, with, with COVID, because we're in the I was just uh, saying to Debbie kind of earlier, we're in this kind of quiet. Uh, I mean, in the rest of the world is raging, and uh, in Asia and, and uh, South America, Central America, and and um, and it seems to be settling down certainly south of the border and and here as well. Uh, there's the sense that life might come back to normal, but um, but now there are more variants out there. It seems that every week or so, another one is described, and there and and some of them are really very risky and questions about about vaccines and going forward, forward with uh, boosters. All, those are all really good questions. And, and just what would we do? And what has been the cost to us and to our neighbors and, and relationships that we value? Those are all things that uh, are really important to discuss. And, and often we get them piecemeal. 
and through this social media, I'm not quite sure how to value them. But um, anyway, that's my sense about it. So if you'd like me, me to make that the next one, just let me know or let Debbie know. Uh, okay, the cervical one is really important one because although you can get into trouble in the lower back, you can get into a lot more trouble in the neck with the same degenerative process because you're dealing with the spinal cord, not just the nerve roots. And uh, so it is an important one to either next uh, month or, uh, or in August, but certainly link it to this one. Same disease. Okay. The hazards of being bipedal. <laughs> Okay. Well, that thank sounds you really good. Much. Check our yeah. events calendar, and you'll be able to see what we've decided as far as the COVID and yeah. the the next installment of the uh, the spine. But um, I think Dr. Brown, you make some good points. We are kind of in a transition. There are lots of questions out there. So I personally am leaning towards a bit of a COVID update for the July. Yes, July, and then so. But please check us out on the, our website, and you'll see what's what's going on. All right, so I'm going to bid everyone a very nice, beautiful day. Enjoy <laughs> your is. afternoon, and um, we'll indeed. see you soon, I hope. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.